intro music. Yeah. Woohoo. All right, everybody, welcome. We are with one of the lead developers here for Star Trek Infinite, and we're going to take the time today to go over all the things. So without me going really long-winded, because most of you who are on my channel, you know who I am, but I'm Rev Deuce. I do a lot of Star Trek gaming content here on YouTube and Twitch, and now meeting with my friend Andre here. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell everybody who you are? Hi, everybody. I'm Andres Chaparra. I'm the technical lead of the project and also de facto Larry Master just by virtue of seeing too much Star Trek. Okay, well, de facto master gets, it's interesting because one of the questions that we You're talked master. about. Yeah. yeah. One of the, what we had talked about was like, who was the biggest Trek fan on the team? And having gotten to meet several people on the team, I'm very happy to say, everybody I've talked to so far actually likes Star Trek. But you'd say you're the top, huh? Uh, I'd say we can go toe to toe with Mats. Uh, he's a bit more focused on the on the small details, and I'm a more big picture, uh, high narrative stuff. But yeah, we could probably do a challenge. All right, quick question: You weren't ready for favorite Star Trek series? TNG. TNG. I was ready for that. Where? Dang! Oh, I was going. Okay, fine. Favorite episode? Favorite episode? Probably a measure of man. That's mine. That's it. it. Feels like it's almost easy, like as a default, but it's such a powerful story, right? And they've even tried to replicate that story a couple of times. Yeah. Newer Star Trek. It's really good. Well, I guess the next one, because I talked to Matt a little bit about this. Let me get your perspective. But what pushed y'all to make this game? Like, what made you want to make a Star Trek specific real time strategy, 4X? What made you want to turn this? We haven't had one in decades. What was the inspiration behind making this? Well, uh, in the beginning, we didn't. Uh, we at Nimble Shine didn't even think uh, this was even possible for us. Uh, but we were talking with Paradox about possible cooperations, and they uh, secured a license with Paramount. And seeing our backstory in Master of Orion and then the Station DLCs and stuff like that, they said, "Hey, why don't you pitch us? Uh, uh, what would you do with a Star Trek game?" in line with Stellaris. So we couldn't believe it, but we jump into the opportunity and give it our best and they liked it. So here we are. How long have y'all been working on the project to get it to the point where it is now right before? It's been around three and a half years counting pre-production negotiations on the stuff, all the pitching process. Well, I mean, not super long. I mean, it's pretty normal when it comes to development, but that definitely speaks to it being a fully fledged out game, right? I just. Y'all got the Star Trek IP and let's throw something together real quick. I'll really put forth the effort to build this from. Yeah, yeah, we got access to the to the code. We branched off uh, near uh, Nemesis uh, DLC uh, code and we started tweaking it from there. Well, that kind of brings the next one because if having played this game a little bit so far, I think at the time of me recording this, I'm around 25, 30 hours into the game. So it obviously has a lot of UI that is similar. There are some differences. This is built from the bottom up of Polaris's, what you said, pre-Nemesis code, right? But what yeah. makes this its own unique game? Why is it not just, say, a Stellaris Reaching or something? What it makes this start? Well, we have a, we had access to the whole code, the assets, and the scripting, and, and everything that makes uh, made Stellaris at that point. And from there, we our mission was to make the best Zarta game that we could make with Stellaris as our tool, our, our template, our starting point, you could say. So we took uh, whatever feeder needs at the, at the time, like the basic of exploration and star systems is perfectly fitted for Star Trek because there are a lot of Trekkies in the Stellaris development team as well. Um, we also started tweaking whatever was close but not quite Star Trek, like warp travel. Star lanes were a no-go, as we mentioned before in the dev logs. Uh, we revamped espionage and governors to fit our needs. The big changes from the original systems in, in Solaris. Uh, we removed things that we felt didn't fit the franchise, like the galactic community. Um, it was a bit too bloaty for us and didn't quite fit the, the franchise. Um, we also added a bunch of new stuff like mission trees, balance of power, galactic tension. We added neutral zones as a way to appease relationships. And additionally, the Star Trek franchise itself brings in a lot of implications uh, for the nature of this game. 
uh, by virtue of having a deep lore of characters that is very different from a blank slate uh, and a procedurally based uh, game like Stellaris. So you know who these are, you know how they interact, what they think about each other. And they also interact in a very different way, have a very different dynamic than playable uh, countries in Stellaris. So it's a very different game. One thing for me I definitely noticed is that with your four major factions, they have multiple play styles and they're they're very different. And how it, with you when you when you're putting this game together based on you know how Solaris is, how important was it for you for the four different factions to have very unique but also diverse play sets, but still be able to play like if you want to play like you would a Klingon as the Federation, you can, but it's definitely a more difficult path to get there. What was that process? Yeah, well, uh, we talked about this in one of our latest uh, devlogs. We started with who these countries are, uh, what do they believe in, stuff like that, and starting deriving the mechanics that they should have and that distinguish them from each other from there. Um, they they have intrinsic mechanics that push them towards specific playstyles, but the, you're not forced into that. Uh, in fact, you can swim against the current, you could say, to, for example, redeem Cardassia if you wanted, but you need to work for it. Yeah, and that's part of where the mission tree comes in here, which is definitely different than, now it's not different to Paradox, having played a lot of Paradox games, Stellaris, Hearts of Iron, Europa Universalis. Uh, we were actually discussing in the Discord that this feels almost more like a Europa Universalis type tree. What really played into adding that and, and do y'all feel that that also gives y'all a lot of things in terms of the future if you wanted to get there eventually not trying to get into the dlc combo but how does that open things up for these factions that makes it kind of a unique way to go well one of the things that we knew about this uh, potential for alternate paths for the powers is that we didn't want it to be a single click a button and now you're something completely different uh we wanted you to have to earn that and the subsequent missions uh, in the mission tree allow you for, uh, to do that. You need to work for that. You need to change a lot of things about how your empire works before you can actually say, I am now redeemed Cardassia. That's, I don't want to give it away. I'll just say that it's, uh, I've gotten to play, I've opened up Federation, Klingon, and Cardassian. They are definitely different, especially because of the tree. Now there's one thing about the Federation that makes them unique that I am hoping y'all add, hero ships. And now they all have their own unique characters. I mean, if you if you want to have Galron, he's there for the Klingons. But there's a hero ship for the Federation. What makes that hero ship really special? Yeah, well, we thought of uh, there are a lot of uh, known characters that will show up as leaders. But when we were thinking about the unique mechanics for the Federation, one of the things was, well, the Enterprise, the flagship of the Federation, is so so iconic as a franchise uh, item that I never really saw in the other powers. There's not like this is the flagship of the Klingons and it's important and it goes for uh, diplomatic missions and stuff like that. They said perhaps a couple of loose mentions in Deep Space Nine. So the flagship was this unique thing about the Federation, which is an, an ambassadorial fleet, if you will, and also those the science and exploration and can stand its own in combat so we wanted to flesh that out as a hero ship now at the same time you know because there are a lot of unique characters per faction but at the same time like i said you, you mentioned it ds9 has got the neg bar for the klingons especially when they come to the station and then tng you know they have the vorchok class that's there so is there the potential again not trying to hit the dlc discussion but is there the potential for each faction to grow and eventually have maybe their own i love the enterprise but Everybody that knows me knows lots of Klingon love. Uh, no, the Klingons have their own mechanics. Uh, they don't have a hero ship. Uh, no, they do have leaders. Push y'all's arm for that. Or push y'all's. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as characters, you know, what, what, what came into influencing how characters play? Because Solaris has always had, you know, admirals, uh, you know, governors, etc. But... How exactly do they play in with Star Trek characters, mixing those in with like the normal Stellaris mechanic, which is having them auto-populate? Yeah, well, it goes to the, the identity of the franchise. These are very familiar faces. Uh, and even just doing the, the portrait, 
when you hear the notification that uh, Garon died in combat in, in some uh, war, that's going to hit you different than if it was a random character. And we also try to do it uh, to give them unique traits that try to represent what they meant and what they did in the in the series. Uh, we have nearly 40 uh, bespoke characters spread across the four powers. Uh, characters definitely take a really heavy play in the Federation mission and don't want to spoil it too much. I definitely want people to enjoy the game and, and find out for themselves. But what exactly does the mission tree do for the faction and for the I mean, we've kind of mentioned it, but um, specifically, what are those trees? Well, on one hand, the mission tree gives you uh, objectives to, to strive for. So it helps a lot for people that in these kinds of games finds like they don't know what to do, where to go. Uh, the, the mission tree gives you a, a heading if you don't have a, an objective of your own. So it helps a lot with that. And additionally, when you achieve uh, many of the nodes, they give you important rewards that push a strong leap forward uh, in the capacities of your power to the point of even being able to reinterpret who that power is. You know, with, Not to mention their value as narrative uh, elements. You mentioned that, you know, because that was actually going to bring up my next question is, for a lot of Star Trek fans specifically, I mean, I, I would love for outside Star Trek fans to come in and enjoy this as a strategy game. But for a lot of Star Trek fans, they've not had this style of game in a very long time. So how comprehensive is like the tutorial system and how much does the mission tree work into this to try to help players get adjusted to this type of game? Uh, I think if anything, Infinite strives to be uh, one of the most accessible uh, games in this genre um, with that uh, quotation the most accessible within this genre, we know is not the simplest one. Yeah. Um, but we tried to focus on the fe the features that were essential for the mechanics of this game, and not perhaps we left some uh, out some cool ideas that we felt like bloating the game unnecessarily in complexity. So it's more accessible for our new people. Um, we do have a tutorial to teach you the basics, but. The best tutorials are the ones that you don't know are a tutorial. So additionally to that, you get the advisor, you get scripted missions after you finish the, the guided tutorial to give you some more uh, specific objectives to look for. And the mission tree itself then gives you uh, more and more goals that force you to go around ex and experience a bit of everything. So you get familiar with the mechanics. Uh, I still fully expect people to start playing and after a couple of hours disco discover that they were doing something wrong and start over. Don't be afraid of losing. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. It's part of the process. Wouldn't be a paradox game if you could figure it out in two hours. I just, <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. I mean, but I will say that I've liked the AI. Uh, we'll say if you've done the pre-order and everything, one really cool aspect is the Klingons. I've got a Klingon voice pack with it. Now, don't make you do the entire AI in Klingon. Obviously, I don't expect any of y'all to speak it, but it is a really nice little lore-friendly touch. And I've also noticed that if you choose to play the game on the easiest setting, you kind of have the time to fumble around. Like, you've got time to make mistakes. The game is not going to just bludge you to death, but if you turn up the AI, it does get more very quickly. Yeah, indeed. All right, so... I do have to hit the big one. I mean, we talked about how this is its own unique game and the mechanics definitely support that. I mean, uh, the biggest change for me, and it might seem simple to a lot, but having played Stellaris for a long time, no warp lanes is tremendous. Now, because now all the ships being based on warp range means theoretically you can go anywhere you want to within just a sphere, which very much changes the entire combat mechanic. But one thing that has always made Stellaris and all Paradox games great has been the modding community. How accessible is modding going to be in this game? What tools are y'all going to kind of prepare for that? Or what would they have them uh, to be able to make more things to make this game even better? And how you know, how much are y'all encouraging modders to pick up Infinite? Well, since since we started from the template of Stellaris, uh, the, most of the tools uh, the modders already know for Stellaris will be familiar to them. Um, they, they're not just for, for the models. Uh, the same tools are used by designers to create content for the game. So it's important to, for us to keep them uh, working as much as for ourselves as for models. 
Uh, I personally love modding, modding and I don't do modding myself, but I do play heavily modded games. Um, so yes, I, I can't wait to see what the community does with Infinite. Uh, we do have a, a couple of channels in the Discord specifically for the modding community to interact with us, to discuss possible improvements, fixes, and tools for them to make their lives easier. Are there any things that, you know, because we, we, in terms of the game, there are a couple of things that feel pretty set. Like, for example, the, the Federation lives where the Federation lives. Are there going to be, like, some limitations to where it comes to modding? Like, be very almost game-breaking to just Federation is in terms of map location? Are there any limiting factors that kind of set modders back a little bit? Well, uh, I would expect that you will need to do some working on making, uh, adapting to uh, the rest of the game to your changes, specifically some expectations of scripted events that relate to narrative uh, events that must happen in a specific way. So you are bound to bre break some stuff if you just move stuff around and leave it as is. But the tools are fairly easy to, to tweak that stuff if you want to. And I want to hit on one more. I know we hadn't talked about this a lot previously. We talked about it in the Discord, but playing the game. Now, keep in mind, those watching, I am a content creator, so I'm not, you know, recording from a laptop. I have a decent computer, but I would also add that this feels more optimized than Solaris. Now, you're starting with a 500-star map. Is that also something that y'all worked really hard on to try to make this that works on many machines now as possible and is also feels very smooth because if I put it on max speed and I've explored the entire galaxy and everybody has got an empire, it still does not feel that the game is lagging at all. It feels very well optimized. Is that a heavy focal point for y'all? Well, we, we knew about a, a couple of pain points uh, from the Stellaris uh, community and the, the developers do, did give us a hand and we had access to their improvements as they went through our development. But uh, we also did some heavy work on the the mathematics of the population internally, how it how it works and how it how it uh, grows, and we don't aim to have a huge large of uh, uh, of and uh, population numbers, so that also helps with the with the performance, and we did remove a bunch of features from Stellaris that we didn't have uh, much use for or didn't fit the franchise, that also helps, and the way that uh, navigation and therefore the pathfinding works also allowed us to start from a new perspective and say how do we make sure that this is optimized well that so again back to kind of like where the modders are going to come in because you know what the first thing is going to happen they're going to try to make the galaxy bigger is that all of these Definitely. changes also going to make those type of mods that optimization is going to roll over and scale up pretty well for that that way because you know some people are going to want to have a five thousand star system instead of just a do you think that because of the way that y'all set up this game and some things have been optimized, that modders will have an easier op you know, opportunity to really grow this unit? I'd say perhaps the, the performance costs of our games moved around and are different uh, from those of Stellaris. But if you want to make the galaxy big enough, yeah, you're going to run to different uh, similar problems that Stellaris uh, does run into. So you may notice some improvements or some different, perhaps the slow parts are somewhere else. You have a mod. Your first mod you're wanting is either add Moopsy or make the galaxy bigger. Level of difficulty will scale. Now this one, I know I've been bugging you and Matt's about it for a while, but I've got to bring up DLC. One, because Paradox games are known for DLC. As a gamer who's been around a while, I actually enjoy that because if I play a game a lot, I want six months, 12 months down the road to have something new that, you know, freshens. I know y'all don't want to commit or talk really big about DLC. You know, is this one of those things that you hope that you have the opportunity to expand and you hope that you have the opportunity to add a lot more of the Star Trek lore into this game at some point? Yeah, well, right now we can discuss in specific about DLCs. Uh, we are focused on the release, making it as, uh, the best that it can be. Yeah. But... If I am given the opportunity, I will gladly work in this project for years. Years? That's that's almost one of those like Todd Howard Starfield type comments. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm happy about that. Like I would again, we're, we're coming from an IP that is just it feels so neglected when it comes to gaming and everything for so long. And I am appreciative for games like Star Trek Resurgence to come out, and you have mobile games like Timelines and 
you know, fleet command. And you do have Star Trek Online, which has been around for about a decade. But honestly, for a long time, Star Trek has been missing type of sphere. So it'd be fantastic to have a dedicated IP title that continues to grow you know, years ahead. Yeah, with I, I did get the feeling that um, I, I did play around with Star Trek Armada in its time, and I always felt like I wish there was more of this. So I share the feeling. Is there anything that you would specifically want? I'm not asking you for any type of DLC sneak peeks, none of that. But you know, you want the Dominion. What would you love to? What would you, go as a Trek fan, to have in your game? Mm, I'd rather not go into that at this point. <laughs> okay. You can't blame I me. I do for have trying. ideas. You have ideas? Well, I mean, that's a good start, right? I mean, it's for me, my mind's already racing, you know, the Dominion or even going into, you know, some of the different time, uh, you know, can we go earlier with the motion picture? Can we go later? How discover you know, 900 years in the future? I mean, it seems like there's so many great possibilities. And there's also aspects of Stellaris, you know, worth mega structure, like different crises. The great thing about these games is the op- you know, possibilities truly can feel endless at times, which is a good thing, but I guess for a game developer, it can also feel a little overwhelming, maybe. Too much to pick for. And <laughs> yeah, we did have to make some tough choices when choosing what made it into the, the release. So a lot of people, for example, cited only five military ships for the Federation. Well, yes, it's, it pained me to leave some out. Well, I, just because you brought it up, I'm curious, is that one of those things because you want to keep a balance, whereas, you know, as much as I love the Cardassians in DS9, you didn't see as many of the ship types and everything as you would with the Federation. Obviously, we see dozens and dozens of ship types in the Federation, but a little bit more limited looks of, like, the Romulan. But is, is that part of it where there just weren't as many options without you maybe coming up with unique designs? There are many angles to that, so... Um... Your official ships for the other factions were, were a, a factor, but we did uh, create some new ones. Uh, so it wasn't like a full-blown limitation for us. But you got to think for, for every ship that you add, uh, you wanted to have a role. You wanted to have difference, uh, differences from any other ships, even those on the same class. So any new ship that you add grows exponentially where you need to think about and balance. So yeah, it's, it's a tough decision to make. Because I have noticed that, you know, Klingon ships definitely start off different in terms of how that they are. It, again, not want to give me a spoilers. Y'all can find out for yourself when you get the game on the 12th. But it definitely feels like each faction caters to a different style of ship, especially with your new crew mechanic, which how exactly does that work? Because that's completely different than how Stellaris works. Yeah, on one hand, having unique uh, ship designs per per power allowed us to tweak and fine tune each design to be unique, to be its own. So you can expect the Bird of Prey to be a lot stronger than a Miranda, which is on the same class, but the Miranda has better protection, which is more uh, in line with what the Federation tends to focus on. And regarding the the crew mechanic, uh, yes, the We've all seen uh, officers die by exploding uh, consoles and stuff like that. So we wanted to bring that in some way into the game. And having the officer pool felt like a natural uh, mechanic, uh, inspired, of course, by uh, we've seen similar mechanics on Europa Universalis, uh, Hearts of Iron. So yes, you need to staff up uh, during peacetime because you're going to feel the attrition when, when you start putting your ships in combat and losing officers. Uh, a ship can be perfectly intact, and if it's not properly crewed, it won't be effective in combat at all. There is and... a significant reduction in viability. They don't. Yes. It's, it's very similar if you played Hearts of Iron, and you can have a nice 20 width infantry unit, but if it is down you know, to 10%, it's completely ineffective. And it feels that way with the ships. and. It doesn't take long for attrition to kick in if you're warring in the major factions, which I found very interesting. You can get away with it in yeah. the minor factions, but if you go with a major faction war, especially if you manage to get all four going at each other, you run out very quickly. I prepared for that. And you won't get reinforcements uh, while in enemy territory. So if you really need to restock your in officers, you need to withdraw that fleet. 
So it really changes their, all your tactics during combat. Oh. Or rather, rather, I should say, during long protracted wars. It, it makes it more of an incentive to almost run all little wolf packs and have small wars instead of just trying to take the Federation out. Yeah, and you need to combine that with the, the changes that free warp travel brings to the strategy of, of a war. You need to spread your fleets around to be able to defend. Uh, if you do the snowball, anybody can sneak around your, your, your big fleet and start really hitting you where it hurts in the, in the core of your I don't, I don't know how I feel about y'all taking away my starbase choke points. There's no more just putting a starbase in the corner of my territory and loading it up with turrets. That's just, those days are gone now. But at the same well, time, there's other things that compensate for you can play around with the expectation of them having a, a warp range that limits how far into your territory they, they can get. But yes, you you do need to think about it. Look, I, I've had, I've enjoyed the conversation. I've loved the Discord. I've obviously enjoyed the gameplay. So I'm biased when I say that I am excited about it. I know you're excited about it. And guess what? On the 13th of October, a day after, we're really hammering you about DLC again. So then you can't use the release excuse because the game will be released. Yeah, but I probably won't be able to give you official answers for a while. <laughs> then I'll go bug Matt's. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you. you. That. I appreciate you spending the time. Uh, anything else that you'd like to add that, you know, that maybe how excited are you? Obviously you're excited. You made the game, but you know, it's uh, anything else that you want to wrap us up with uh, that you can think of or excited yeah. to see what the players think. Really, making this game is a dream come true for many of us. Uh, we made some new Star Trek fans during the development uh, within the development team. Uh, some people that had never watched it and were mind blown from the very first episode when Q starts teasing Picard and the crew. Um, they couldn't believe this came out in, this, in the 80s. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, it's amazing. And uh, I also hope to see to hear similar stories uh, from the the players. Like I never seen TNG, uh, TNG or Star Trek as a whole before, and this made me a fan. And I never played GSG games before, and I gave it this opportunity because it was a Star Trek game. And I now I want to look into other GSG games. This looks amazing. Uh, I hope to hear those stories, and also as it's. It's a tradition on Paradox games. They, they usually made a Zoom forum to tell your own adventures within the alternate histories of the game. So I'm willing to read some nice stories in there. And it's, so hopefully that ends up being the case. And hey, you can join the Trick Infinite Discord if you want. It's a very friendly, fun place with a lot of nerds. Yeah. Get right in if you're watching this video. Look, Andre, thank you so much for taking the time. I am excited for the game. It's going to be thing here on October 12th, and at the time of this releasing this very soon. I went to watch yeah. this and uh, get excited within 48 hours. But if you're on the fence about getting it, I would say grab it. Again, I'm biased. If nothing else, you come watch me play it. If you're on YouTube, we'll be doing out videos to help you all, especially if you're new to these style of games and new to the game. We'll go over some of the bases, get you ready, and uh, also can check it out. Again, Thank you, and uh, I will bug you for more of these as we have more content rolling out for the game. Thanks a lot, Rev. Live long and prosper. Long and prosper. An even better outro than the intro. For the empire and glory to your house. <laughs>